We are about to celebrate our 100th episode, and we want you there. Media Litter Sandwich, we are recording our 100th episode on July 21st, 2018 at Falling Down Beer Company in Warren, Michigan. The event starts around 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and it's free. So come down, hang out. If you need more details, check out the website at medialittersandwich.com. And if you want to help out, email us at podcast at medialittersandwich.com. Today on Media Litter Sandwich, we talk about Cynical Man, the amazing Cynical Man. Welcome to Media Litter Sandwich. This, I think this is our last episode at the Don River Comic Con. Today we're being sponsored by Crusader Cross, uh, which is this wonderful comic book here. And you could uh, purchase that if you go to Reborn Comics. Yes, uh, www.rebornComics.com. All right. IndiePlanet.com. All right. RebornComics.com. And today, of course, we have Mark from... CrazyMark.com. Will from... AllAboutWilliam.com. And I'm Toten from Toten.com. And of course, you can find us at MediaLitterSandwich.com. With us, maybe a little bit of cynic, amazing cynicism. Man, I can't talk today. Please introduce yourself. You, we had had your merchandise on our show multiple times. Hi, Toten. I'm Matt Fazell, creator of the Amazing Cynical Man, America's laid-off superhero. We've had, um, I don't have any with me right now, but in the past, you might see us drinking coffee from uh, coffee cups that don't have a smiley face on. They just have a straight face and says, have a day. Those are all from Matt here. And really, <laughs> those are amazing. I love drinking out of those coffee cups. We're like, wait a second, have a day? <laughs> hey, Willie Weasel's worn them on many shows. He's actually had the sticker on his lapel. So if you watch some of the most recent Crazy Mark TVs over the past year, you'll see Willie Weasel wearing the half a day on his lapel. Oh, that's crazy. Ah. <laughs> it was like in the 70s, there was that smiley face that said, have a nice day. And like two weeks after somebody invented that, somebody invented the have a rotten day face, which is a frowny face. And like the next day after that, somebody said, why not have a day? So it just became part of our cultural and heritage. <laughs> so tell us about the Amazing Cynical Man. It's the Amazing Cynical Man. His secret identity, not secret, his identity is John Q. Cynical. It's his first year out of college. He got a room at mom and dad's boarding house and, and signed up with the Acme Temp Agency. And they sent him out to the board of superheroes because he's got a degree in popular culture. And all you can do with a degree in popular culture is read comic books for a living. And that's what they do at the Board of Superheroes. Or start a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> he should have started his own podcast, but this was like the 90s when I was coming up with this. So right. podcasts hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> but you know, it's the whole deal about the guy out of college, unemployed and everything. It sounds like your superhero is all-American. He's all-American. He's the all-American, amazing, cynical man. Because that's the state of the economy right now for a lot of guys who just got out of college. Right. I know I'm looking forward to a <laughs> cynical man kind of life. Unemployed superhero by Acme, who should have just started his own podcast. <laughs> and instead, what did he do? He signed up uh, at a temp agency, the Acme Temp Agency. Uh huh. They sent him out to a place where they needed help. Uh, People reading comic books, so we got a job reading comic books for a living. <laughs> Strangely enough, they also require you to wear a superhero suit while you're reading comic books for a living. So he gets to dress up as a superhero. But the comic strip is is like less about superheroes, and it's more like a, a sitcom. It's like a Seinfeld right. episode. Yeah. I noticed the you have various different types of paper. You have an actual, you know, you have actual books. You have uh, then you have kind of like a printout colored paper, and you even have like comics on sticky notes that you have at your table. Like it looks like you just wrote them on post-it notes almost. Yeah, those are the the, the draw cynical man get a free mini comic sketches. Those are by like uh, people at the convention. Okay. All those. It's, it's not. There's no narrative there. It's, I, I just say draw a cynical man get a free mini comic, and it's whatever they come up with. 
goes on the post-it mill. Most people have never heard of Cynical Man, mm -hmm. and it's their first shot at it, so it's pretty cool. <laughs> William, do you got anything? You're no. itching up at the microphone. No, I was just listening. I plugged okay. up. Okay. So, I happen to have someone here that uh, ha um, he would like to know more about making a movie based off of the book. In fact, um, William, do you mind just letting him sit? Yeah, I can do that. Okay. Do, 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 do. Now, don't stab anybody with that oh, word sword. Wait. I just realized, so when you're talking to people, do you, do you just, like when you agree, do you just hold your sword and go, word? Um, sometimes, yeah. I, I want your sword. <laughs> Sorry, Matt. I, I knocked a word, word yo. <laughs> yeah, I grew up during that era where that was a um, common Man, theme. <laughs> So is the sword mightier than the pen? Oh, that's a I good don't know. question. I, I, duel, duel, <laughs> duel, duel, duel. It looks like someone might use the pen to color in the sword. <laughs> so, so you actually have a cynical man movie, and I do own this movie, and it was, you know, it's, it, it was, it's obviously done a few years ago. Yeah, back in 2007, mm -hmm. um, when in the big recession, me and all my out of work friends. Got together and we made a movie. <laughs> and it was awesome. I got to write my first screenplay. Uh -huh. I, I spent like six months storyboarding the whole movie. And uh, we had a casting call. We got some real actors. And we got some real actors to show up. And um, uh, they did a great job. And uh, a lot of my friends pitched in and dressed up as characters from the comic strip. And they did a great job too. And they did. What were some shot of them? in Hamtramck in 2010, uh -huh. and we edited it in 2011. Came out in 2012. So it took like three years to do the whole thing. Wow, wow three, three years. years to do. I mean, it, you know, because it was shot in 2010, which doesn't seem that long ago, but the technology was different, so it does kind of look like a YouTube sketch. But it's, it is really funny. Absolutely. Uh, go ahead. Took three years for that. Wow. Why did it take so long? I, 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 I worked know. in movies. You know I could give you 20 I, 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 reasons. I'm just. I, we knew I, there was a big chance it would um, it would really suck. <laughs> so uh -huh. I didn't want it to really suck because we didn't work hard enough at it. Mm -hmm. So we all worked as hard as we could, tried to make it the best movie we could. But I'll tell you what, Matt, that's like relatively like small potatoes compared to what Matt Bush is doing with his Aladdin movie. And yeah. it's still going oh, on man. and on and on. I guess they've been working How on long that since been 2010 or yeah. something. Yeah, they've been filming that for a very long time. Yeah. Three years isn't long, that long. No, no, not film. compared to... Yeah. I mean, I would definitely give you credit compared to a lot of the other like uh, independent movies um, that are shot kind of like how Zinical Man was shot. Uh, you can't tell the changing of the seasons because I've seen that at film festivals where it's like, wait a second, was this summer, winter, fall? What? It's like, well, over the course of two years, it's all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that tree grow another six foot during the entire movie. <laughs> it's like side angle A. Summer, side angle B, winter, where'd the leaves go? <laughs> hey, Crusader Cross, go ahead and give us a real quick, uh, uh, go ahead, introduce yourself real quick and feel free to start, you know, asking questions like, what, what questions do you have about making a movie? Because, right. I mean, I know you got some. Yeah, um, like, how did you choose your cast? First off, um, what's your name? Oh, yeah, yeah, my name is um, Asher Shelton, but okay. uh, today I'm Crusader Cross, obviously. Um, um, the name of my comic book company is Reborn Comics. Um, you can find us on www.rebornComics.com. Um, but um, yeah, the questions I got are like, how do you convert like um, your comic books into like a script, a movie script? And like, how did you choose your cast or did you just kind of randomly choose them as you went along? Or did you just kind of say, okay, this guy fits this role, I want him. Like, how did you choose? I'd say make a bunch of friends that, um are interested in making movies and you'll find people in, in your group of friends that know how about how to format a screenplay. Okay. And uh, so I worked with a guy named Gary Freeman who got co-writing credit on the screenplay because uh, he 
like taken classes in screenwriting and knew how to format a screenplay so that it looked like something that they use in the movies. Okay. So if, if you if you type it up right with the right margins and returns and stuff, it, each page of the screenplay will equal about one minute of film time, and that's. Um, Everybody expects that to look right. Now, Matt, okay. uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but they have a few apps online that you can actually download and use that as your uh, entire, uh, what, it's kind of like the skeletal work for your own screenwriting. I didn't use an app. I read a book. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's on those apps that will actually help you learn the formatting of it. Word. I got, I got Word. another question. Um, like, my movie might be kind of expensive because it's like a post-apocalyptic world and like, like, how do you plan for that type oh, of budget man. or get the finance? I bet you there's lots of places in Detroit. You <laughs> That's could why they call their use a green screen and a JPEG background. <laughs> there are a lot green of screen. tricks. Yeah. I have made okay. uh, for a 48-hour film competition, uh, meaning I had to write, edit, and everything within 40, 48 hours. Uh, we had we did a post-apocalyptic thing in Campus Martius. Uh, yeah, we filmed the Campus Martius, and we had to make it look like there was nobody there. Sweet. And this is in the middle where everybody else participating had to also film a scene in Campus Martius. There are ways to do it. Camera angles, just finding an area, you know, finding, an, you know, finding even not a full area, but just video versions different than the audio version. Just a frame's worth is what you're looking for, for for nobody or just for what you're shooting sometimes. I mean, you not only have Detroit, you got Flint. You got a lot of uh, places out there, and there's a lot of things that can help you with that. Uh, I know many people that actually use the zombie walks to help uh, and get some extra shots by doing the zombie walks. Uh, and I think it's really interesting having both of you on here. The Cynical Man it has a lot of, it's really bare bone, but it's hysterical. It's very dialogue, you know, it, it's, it's dialogue and humor driven. Uh, Crusader Cross is very, very gritty. Um, a lot of different colors, a lot of emotions on the face. I mean, Matt doesn't really have a face on some of his characters. <laughs> And it's right. very but the detailed. stuff is really well drawn. It's well drawn, well colored. And let me ask you, Crusader Cross, you you get it together. You, you do all the inking. You do all the colors. You you have it all set up and ready to go for the printers, right? Right. Dude, man, you're wearing a lot of hats there. Besides <laughs> this one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah do, do you have any other questions? Um, I just said about covers it. Uh, you know, other all, than all that stuff you do in the comic book is all marketable skills. Right. Yeah, it's an on ramp. So are you saying he could use it to not be unemployed? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, I, I do got a question. For your day, do you have a day job? Yes, I have a day job. Okay. And you don't have to tell me what it is or anything. It's, it's a pretty simple yes or no. Um, <laughs> do any graphics? of the skills? Um, actually, no. Um, actually, I'm a um, substitute art teacher. Okay. Oh, okay. So, so that does answer sub, my question. I was going to ask. Yeah. If any of your skills that you use for any of this apply to your day job and yeah it does yeah it actually does yeah so were you classically trained with uh, the uh, art uh, did you go to a specific uh, university or college uh, yeah i went to um ccs for a couple of years okay. all right idt stuff like that i got my associates right in graphic That's a good design. yeah matt, matt you uh, have a background what's your education background uh, well, i went to school for journalism Right. Okay. I was always like writing and drawing my own stick figure comics, even uh -huh. in high school. You look kind of so. like a journalist, not that you mentioned. Yeah. No, yeah. No, no. <laughs> uh, so, like, I knew I couldn't draw, so I, I thought I could be a writer. What do writers do? They're journalists. So, and, you know, this is during Watergate, so journalists were heroes. So, mm -hmm. um, I went and got a journalism degree, and I found out I was a bad reporter. I really, I didn't like doing it. And I did bad at it, but what I enjoyed was working in newspaper production. So I got into newspaper production, which found a way into working for ad agencies and reproduction, like uh, printing studios and stuff. And uh, now I'm making a pretty good living as a graphic artist <laughs> and keeping up the cartooning. I'm All American. It pays for drawing stick figure comics. 
Woohoo! All Ooh. American art. Yes, and he's an all American character. Yeah, there's actually. I, I heard not long ago I was at a convention with someone on the panel, and he was. Nothing to do with the panel was about. He started complaining about how he would school for journalism and blah 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 blah. He's a security officer, and it's like you know, going to school for journalism gives you a door for a lot of different jobs. And as you mentioned, ad agency. I've known a lot of people that work for ad agencies and doing promotions that went to school for journalism, and so a lot of that transferred to. Okay, so cynical man. So. A lot of is this just like kind of your point of view dealing with day to day situations or things you wish you could say but you didn't? I mean, yeah, yeah, a lot of it. <laughs> I get a lot of my ideas um, uh, talking back to the radio. Okay, I'm, I'm one of those people that have this affliction where you're always making jokes about everything, and it's really mm -hmm. annoying, especially in a high school kid, until you learn to like shut up and just like talk to yourself in the car and talk back to the radio and every once in a while I'll come up with something I think is pretty funny and I'll write it down. I also listen to all my friends and write down what they say that's funny and uh, that's how I like, find jokes. That, that's now, like our life. <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Now, I, I got a question here, Matt. You know, I'm, I'm looking at Crusader Cross's comic books that are, you know, realistic and drawn with all sorts of perspective and everything and your comics which pretty much any of the kid cosplayers around here could do on their own and put on mom's refrigerator what made you want to go minimalistic well I was, I, um, I was doing minimalistic when I was in junior high in seventh grade and it just seemed like the obvious thing to do because I wasn't interested in impressing people with how I would draw uh, just by, like telling jokes and so make, what was making the, people laugh What was them. the so aha moment? I, was it Pictionary or was it just uh, over a, a burger and pizza <laughs> and beer? <laughs> what made year? you say? 1980. What? And 1980. Yep. Wow. And it was the Ramones. It was Elvis Costello. It was punk rock. I was working in a record store and listening to all this great music and realizing this is... It's like so much better than that overproduced crap we were listening to in the 70s. You just like take away all that stuff and just come down to the, the beat, the guitar, the singer, and that's rock and roll. Why am I trying to make comics? I was like trying to be a Marvel comic book artist by then. Oh, yeah. And uh, why am I trying to make comics with, with all this crazy um, book learning art that I was really bad at? Why don't I just... Like, see how much I can take out and draw comics again, like I did in junior high. So I did that. I drew um, a back of a record store handout. Um, I gridded it off into panels and drew a non-smiley, smiley face, and I named him the Amazing Cynical Man, because it's something icky and something that everybody wants. It's like the Clash. It's like the Sex Pistols or something, you know? It's like yeah. something icky, but then you hear that great music. It's right. like... Who's making that great music? It's the Clash. Oh, we don't want Clash, but I want that great music. <laughs> oh, Cynical Man, that sounds icky, but it's going to be really fun. Right. So they pick it up and read it and say, wow, I want more of this. And, uh, and then I saw a mini comic and I made it into a mini comic and I made, um, made that stick figure art. I was able to condense a lot of information into a small space. And the aha moment was when somebody picked a mini comic up off the counter in the record store where I had them on display. They didn't have a price on them, so he asked me, how much for the mini comic? And I said, I don't know, how about a quarter? And <laughs> he handed me a quarter, he took the mini comic, and the lights came up, and the band played the theme to 2001, A Space Odyssey. And I've just been doing it ever since. It was the first time I had ever made money off my comics. And suddenly, Chick Comets, Chick Comics had serious competitions. <laughs> oh, Chick Tracks. Chick Tracks. <laughs> now, uh, that kind of brings me to another question, like, um, like the music. How important is the music soundtrack, like, in a movie? And, oh, yeah. Like, how do you choose? Yeah, how did you choose, like, your music? Um, I, my producer, Aaron Trudgeon and Linda Comp, okay. had uh, a stack of CDs that they had um, asked local bands to... Uh, let them use in their movies. Okay. And so he had a bunch of stuff to use, and I just like, um, I didn't know how to go about it, but I let, I let Aaron like uh, put 
put a bunch of music into the soundtrack. And then I said, no, I don't like that. And then I had to ask myself what I did like and what I wanted to use there instead. So his, his first step allowed me to make the next step. Have somebody add a soundtrack to your movie and then uh, decide whether you like it or not. And the stuff you don't like, you'll replace with something you do like. And you realize, oh yeah, that's what I wanted in there. Right on, right on, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. It also helped to like, pick, up, pick out music of, in my own library that I didn't have the rights to, like um, uh, Elvis Costello and, and Devo music and uh, Plastic Bertrand and like stuff that we didn't have the rights to, but um, I added into the music, I added into the soundtrack just to see how it looked and sounded. And it, it gave me something um, to think about what I needed to, it to sound like, you know? Yeah, so you can, you can put in music that you like that you don't have the rights to, but yeah, and you just don't use do them in the final product. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. for your final product, you go to something like GarageBand or uh, Cakewalk or something like that to compose your own music. Yeah, or you yeah. could go yeah. to a lot of different um, production sites. There's a ton of music production sites like Twisted Tracks or or uh, Audio uh, Blocks or there, there's there's a billion of them, and you can find something similar. To what you are using, but you can purchase the rights to that for under a hundred bucks. Okay, that's cool. It's um, good to know. Yeah, but music to as a motivator. I mean, there's comic books out there. My favorite uh, example of this is Scott Pilgrim. Is they actually write down this is the music I was listening to while I was writing this. And when they eventually made the movie, they put a lot of those songs in the in the soundtrack. Oh, that's cool. So he kept a similar mood that he had when he was actually right. illustrating a comic book. I know another local okay. uh, comic, uh, which we had on the show, uh, uh, Cam Comics. Uh, he talk, He does the same thing inside of his com comics. He'll just write down on the side, like, you know, mu what music is playing. And that's the music that helped influence whatever's going on. Right. I don't know if you ever met Cam Comics, but fantastic. Uh, okay. Or Kool-Aid, was it Kool-Aid Cam, right? Yeah. Kool-Aid Cam, okay. Yeah. Cool. Have to check him out. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's fantastic. Yeah. Absolutely. So, oh, do you have any other questions? Um, I think that's about it. Uh, like, how did you, okay, like, when you saw the final project, like, how did you, like, judge it? And um, how did you, like, say, okay, this is it? With an ounce of cynical... <laughs> <laughs> how did we know we were? Yeah, finished? how cynical were you? <laughs> yeah, were you like, um, hmm, I'm not sure if this is it, or I need to take well, this out, or you know, yeah. How much editing? We were set a deadline. <laughs> okay, we, we knew know we about were the gonna, deadline. We were taking that down to a small press show in Columbus, space in Columbus, and that was going to be in April, and so that gave us till then to finish it. So, okay, after a year of editing, we figured that was enough. We're gonna get it done. In April, it will be finished, no matter what it is. And uh, okay, so you were done in, with the movie in two years, and then you had to edit it for like another year. We shot it over the summer of um, 2010. Okay. And then we edited it over most of 2011, and then uh, April 2012 was when we had to stop working on it. Oh, okay. So that it gave us enough time. You know, that, that's something that a lot of people have issues with. And what comes to one of my favorite questions is, how do you know when something's done? How, when do you end the project? And, you know, that I, it seems easier for you because it's part of your product that, that, that does, like, that's minimalistic. I wanted it to be, it, it's, I, if... I wanted to be able to look at it and, and not see any problems that I didn't know how to fix. Right. If I saw a problem and I knew how to fix it, I figured we better fix it. But at the same time, it's and within the theme of the comic of for it to not be polished. For, you know, I mean, well, polished to lucky. a point. Let me put, <laughs> let me rephrase. Polished to a point. It doesn't, it, it, it doesn't, uh, like, it's punk music. But it's not pop punk where everything yeah. is perfectly. I mean, come Blink One Eight Two, Jonas Brothers, um, a lot of the wannabe punk bands out there right now, Jonathan Young, they may sound great, 
but it's so polished, I wouldn't call yeah, it Yeah, I was punk. about to say, like, punk is like Minor Threat or like uh, Angry Samoans, you know, that kind of thing, Black Flag, that kind of stuff. Mm. MDC, okay. Millions of Dead, eh. <laughs> no, Millions of Dead Cops, MDC. It, it's easy to tell what kind of music we listen to on the show. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that, that's, that's punk. Notice I'm so, not saying anything. <laughs> the most important thing is would be um, getting a good uh, vocal soundtrack, okay. getting getting the dialogue uh, really well recorded. That was our biggest stumbling yeah. block: is not recording the dialogue good enough. Oh yeah, okay, so the, the audio, audio the sound, is yeah. way yeah. more important than the visual. People are way more forgiving when it comes to visual than right. they are the audio. Right. Mm-hmm. So the sound quality. Absolutely. Yep. Like loudness, uh, clarity, crispness. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's better to have some stuff a little bit more quiet than have it peaking and distorting like a kazoo. Right. You now go, you go to the movies. You go to a, a professional Hollywood movie, and there's the you know you see the people coming in the room, and they're talking to each other way in the background, and it, it's perfectly clear. You can hear what they're talking yeah. about. Sound and effects. Too, if you right. tried to record that in yeah. one of the movies we make. It would just be like hollow and echoey, and you'd say, what are they saying? What? Well, why do you want to hear the other people's dialogue in the background unless it's part of the story, you know? <laughs> so you got to learn how to overdub that sound and, and get it recorded right. All right. Stuff now, like is there that. anything you would do differently? I mean, now that you're done with the movie, you saw it, I mean... Better there... sound, better light. Okay. Yeah. That's a good thing. Great advice there, Matt. And, you know, Toden's brought up a lot of great things as far as uh, production goes. But additionally here, Crusader Cross, what do you want to accomplish with your movie? Um, I want to reach a lot of um, different people from different backgrounds. I want to make it a diverse movie. Uh, I want to show people, like, the contrast between dark and light. And um, I want to show, like, uh, the power of the human soul the human spirit, what it's able to accomplish, like when it's focused and uh, when it's at its peak. Beautiful dreamers. <laughs> something oh, no. on TV. He's thinking of a song and I'm thinking of After Effects. I'm thinking of Maya, Maya. I'm thinking of all these different special effects programs. You know, you might have to collab with some peeps in the art school areas where they're working yeah. with the uh, 3D animation and oh, yeah, high-end sure. special effects. So. Yeah, I definitely want to do that. Um, Back to school with you. I'm a big fan of the Matrix, um, so I yeah, want to do... that's huge budget to cut <laughs> that It looks up. like he already had the... You know, <laughs> Maybe you should look more to animation. Right. <laughs> you know, that, and that's right. not a bad idea. Yeah, it's not definitely a bad idea. He took the red pill. Yeah, I'm thinking or like st- a lot of CGI. You know <laughs> with your stuff, Definitely think about the uh, um, the motion comics okay. where people just move the mouths and you just go from panel to panel. It's a lot cheaper and it's and there's actually a good market for it. And it's really cool. Okay. Look cool. into motion comics for for as well as your art is. I think it would do very well. Okay, I actually well, considered talk- that before. Oh man. Yeah, you ever watched the motion comics for like Watchmen or even a lot of the yeah X-Men Watchmen was now. really cool and yeah, the Black they- Panther. Yeah. I don't know if you guys saw the Black Panther uh, no, Not motion the motion comic. comics one. Yeah, no. it was pretty cool. I saw some of the episodes of the actual animation, but not the motion Yeah, he comic. actually fought like Captain America in it. a series of them. Like a, but, yeah, they were really cool. Yeah. And I, I think that might be a good start for you. Okay. So cool. you're talking about like the motion comics like Marvel did back in the 60s with the Hulk and <laughs> with Thor. Well, early 2000s and... they did it, too. They had a lot of motion comics. Um, but... You know, hey, thank you for coming on the show, Crusader. Thanks for having you, me. I'm going to let you get back to your booth. Okay, cool. Crusader Cross, everyone. Ooh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Word, yo. And you could check out Crusader's Cross Comics at RebornComics.com. Uh, he's one of our sponsors today, which we are very grateful for. And, oh, I got to take another look at Cynical Man. I There was a good time. I had a ton of these just sitting on my... Uh, on my uh, work desk. <laughs> I'm just like, eh, I don't... You need some more. I, I do. I do need more of them. I mean, just something just to look at, make me laugh, and go back to work. You know, are you thinking of... Uh, how are you thinking of merchandising Cynical Man more? I mean, are there any future plans for uh, merchandising your character? Um, um, I don't think about merchandising a lot. 
until um, I run out of whatever I'm merchandising at the moment. Like I, I, um, I think that's the case. Made some the... coffee cups. Cynical Man's <laughs> always sitting there with a coffee cup that says "Have a Day" on it. I love your I've done that for cups. decades. Yeah. And eventually, I got around to making coffee cups that say "Have a Day" on them. And I'm down to my last box of those. So I'm thinking about what are we gonna do next? And a friend of mine said, well, "Let's print a comic strip on a coffee mug." So we made some of those. And. Um, I got plenty of merchandise now. When I run out of something, I'll I'll think of what to do next. I mean, have a day is quite catchy. Have you thought about getting it into like uh, like chain stores or something like that? I think somebody's already making have a day stuff. Oh, recycled paper products in Chicago came out with a have a day calendar over a decade ago. Okay, so there might not be have a day stuff in there now, but it's. Uh, is it it's, trademark? Is it's a not a trademark. It's just okay. part of a common cultural heritage. Okay. So anybody that wants to say have a day, go for it. But you can't use Cynical Man's face. That's mine. Or else. <laughs> I'll show up in a pinstripe suit. One thing I noticed. At least uh, I die. Hi, guys. Uh, one Good. thing I noticed on there is you have date stamped on the back of some of these. Yeah, it's a little date stamp. Every... Uh, every print run has the date stamp it was printed on it stamped on it okay yeah so that's not individual to the comic it's nope. just individual to the day that was that was uh printed yeah okay it's like Can a I... seal of authenticity i'm wondering someone looks at it's like oh this is april 17 2017 do you have any of the 2015 uh, prints <laughs> no, I try and get rid of them. <laughs> Sounds like wine. I'll take a cynical man, uh, dated 1942. Uh, I, the earlier dates are worth more, man. They just yeah, age. They ones. taste better. That's how I know it's the first print. And sometimes they're on different color paper, so you want to get the variant editions, right? <laughs> so I got the, I got the orange. I, I want to get the green. Get the red. You know, the whole rainbow. Oh wait a minute, this is the month of June. I'll take the rainbow edition. <laughs> I could print one one signature in one color and another inside signature in a different color and like spice it up that way. Now, how much do you sell your comics for? 50 cents. They've only come up a quarter since 1980. 19... Oh, man. Yeah. And that's I think that's one reason I've had so, you know, I bought quite a few of your things is because of the price and when you walk around you know the comic con there's so much amazing comics everywhere i mean you go from crusader cross which is you know completely bound and really you know good art you know wh whether you like the storyline or, or not the you know it's a it's a different level than cynical man because yep. you come across cynical man you're like I can afford that with my pocket change. Yeah, it's easier to buy it than to not buy it. <laughs> yeah, just think it could be good luck too. But over here, okay, what not available? I saw this. It said not available books. Now, what kind of publishing co is that? Your publishing company? Yeah, not of DBA, not available comics, not available books. Cool. And it says over here. Well, it says fourteen ninety five. But that's for the whole thing, you know. So it's like you shoved a whole bunch of 50 cent pieces into this. Hey, that's a it's bargain. 150 pages. Times 50 cents. But it isn't that. Divided it's, by seven. Yeah. Carry the nine. 50 cents, right. Um, um, factor pi into that. But it's the going rate for paperbacks these for days. For the Rembrandt of stick lately. figure mini comics. That's what it says. And I believe everything I read. So there. So well, it was on the internet. It's got to be true. Oh, yes. Truth is on, on the, the internet. internet. So do you have any inspirations aside from Cynical Man? Like, you knew I, at one point, did you know you wanted to be an artist? Or did, I mean, you were talking about the other comic book artists at the time. But who do you look I, to as being maybe inspiration? Or hmm. someone you like to, to read? What who are your favorites? Wow, I just scored a book uh, with some old Kirby um, reprints at this show. And um, boy, that Jack Kirby can really draw. Oh, uh, Jack Kirby, yeah. he was the man. I, I mean, sure am glad I read all those Kirby comics when I was a kid. <laughs> I mean, Jack Kirby was essentially DC and Marvel. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's, it, it, you know, Stan Lee just sat there and said, I want to see a character that looks like this. 
and Jack Kirby made it happen. Boom. Yeah. And while you know, while he while he was doing that, he also did like six or seven other characters. He said, Stan, how about a character that does this? Awesome! We'll put him in the next Fantastic Four. And, and then what happened? Jack Kirby got what was it, an apartment oh. building somewhere? And yeah. I mean it's it, everybody look it up online, you know, look up Jack Kirby because you know, Stan Lee, he's the gazillionaire who got away with all that stuff. And then Jack Kirby, he pretty much, in an ideal world, Jack Kirby would have owned several yachts, many houses by the seashore, you know, he, he that kind of thing. He would have been the household name versus Stan Lee. Yeah, Jack Kirby. The guy was a, a, a marvel. And a DC. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what he did, you know? So I, I am curious. I see a lot of shows, and you have perhaps one of the cheapest products out there does is this just a hobby or do you actually make money off of this well i do claim it as a deduction on my taxes mm -hmm. so um i have to track how much money i make and it always does come out to a little bit more than what i spend to make it so it's um i'm making a little money on it and most of it's paid for by my career as a graphic artist <laughs> I also have some freelance clients that like hire me to, to illustrate stuff on their website and in the presentations with stick figure characters. And I also work for Disney Adventures magazine from 2000 to 2007, wow. uh, contributing a, a monthly um, stick figure comic so, to their pages. So now we've now interviewed several people that work for Disney. Just want to put that out there. <laughs> they are a big company. Yeah, they are. I mean, I'm not I, saying it was hard to do. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, it's like, how did you get that gig with Disney? Did you draw the three characters in the back of the magazine and send it in, or how 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 that happen? Well, the editors of that magazine really loved comics. Yeah, they were into comics, and um, the editor at the time was trying to get in touch with Scott McCloud to ask him to contribute something. Right on. And he. Uh, found a link to my website on Scott's website, thanks Scott, and got a hold of me through there and said, uh, well, I read Zot in Dimension 10 and a half. Do you want to do something like that in the back of Disney Adventures magazine? And I said, yeah, right. Who is this? But it was really him. <laughs> it was really the editor at Disney Adventures. So, wow, shocking. Uh, I said, yes, I'll send you some samples, and I did. And about a year later, they said, um, we, well, we got a spot opening up. We're going to take out this contest by the um, staff box in the front of the magazine. And can we put like a, a vertical comic strip about the wacky adventures of the Disney Adventures staff when no one's looking or between issues? So it was the Dizzy Adventures. Wow, great story there, man. You know, so. That's how it happened. It's so it, it, it Dumb it was, luck. Oh, there you go. It's and like, so don't go pursuing something. It's like chasing a dog, and you're better off sitting there eating a hamburger than trying to chase the dog. Wait for the dog to come to you, right? And also, publish mini-comics and trade them with everybody you know. I was trading mini-comics in the 1980s with a guy named Scott McLeod in Terrytown, New York. Oh, And man. that was his, you know, his family spelling of the name, is, and it's pronounced McLeod. So his, his pen name is McLeod. And so later on, when he was drawing Zot for Eclipse Comics, he asked me to contribute a stick figure version of Zot in the back. And that's how Zach in the back. later on in the 21st century, he helped me get in touch with the editors at Disney Adventures. Zach in the back. <laughs> so draw mini comics, trade mini comics with everybody you know, build up networks. Figure out what you do and wow. do it well. You know, because we're talking so, stick figures here. We're talking stick figures getting into high-profile magazines. <laughs> and this We're talking networking than here. So someday, Toten's going to be like the boss of a, a, a movie studio, and I'm going to come looking for work for, to him. Pass. <laughs> <laughs> I've had offers from movie <laughs> studios. I'm, I, I'm good. Maybe if I ran it right. <laughs> um, from my couch, I'd be okay. <laughs> someday, uh, so I'm going to need uh, somebody that can make a movie or a short film or a publication piece or somebody's going to hire me to illustrate something that they're doing and they're going to ask me if I know anybody that can make the movie and I'll say yeah I know this guy so it's all 
about Network. eventual hookups. Never would have happened if I hadn't have done Cynical Man. <laughs> there you go. Stick with your dreams. If you got something, no matter how weird or crazy or crappy, might just say, because it's keep your doing hobby it. doesn't mean it can't be part of your resume. Just do it. I'm sure when when you know this guy with the Crusader, uh, it doesn't matter what it kind of ties into or Crusader what world Cross. he's going after. I'm sure they look at the art and respect the art, and it's part of his resume. The same thing with the stick figures. Wow, did you build a resume off of that? <laughs> you know, it's I'm kept making... me from getting boring jobs. <laughs> I love that. Isn't that the goal? I love my job too, and it came from making YouTube videos, and it became part of my resume. Yeah, you know, and that definitely helps because when you do an interview or when you're submitting portfolios to jobs and that stuff's in your portfolio, a lot of the, the companies that look at that and go, oh, why is this in here? You probably don't want to work for them anyway. <laughs> yeah, I came down off of eight-tenths of my jobs being from jobs from hell. So, you know, I'm sticking with a lot of the stuff I like and now that I have that wondrous degree, I'm going to probably write my own ticket hopefully well you're somewhere. even telling me that you were doing uh mark you were doing um all your fun stuff when you first got the job and you really enjoyed it it wasn't until a new company took it over it was a hostile takeover and i know how to and do and they didn't appreciate oh no no i found out it doesn't matter when the new company moves in a hostile takeovers get rid of them what they do is they wait till after the severance period and then they go on the attack and they force you out because if you quit, they don't have but to pay. But they appreciate all your extra craziness. The, the new company that moved in? Yes. No. Okay, that was my answer. Because they didn't appreciate because anybody. If you would have applied, but if you would have applied with your resume, with all your portfolio in it, they probably would have turned you away. Well, the thing was. You were already there, but. Yeah, I was already there. Yeah. But we all had to apply again. Really? And they accepted me. Because I had short hair, and I put on a good act. See, but why did you put on any act? Well, you know, when you have good money, yeah. When you have good money coming in, instead of being dumped right off the bandwagon, you know, you want to be able to at least make a transition. I mean, something tells me, you know, Matt comes into a convention in the summer in a, in a gym with no air conditioning, wearing a tie, you know, slacks, everything. I, I don't think he's going to go and put on shorts and a Hawaiian shirt just to go to Taco Bell after this. <laughs> I, I'm, this is pretty much what you wear for what, you, what we call our what we laughingly call our job. Yeah. Don't I, be fooled. I it's nice this. outside. I just got out of bed and came here this morning, you know. <laughs> Again, don't be fooled. The temperature is nice in here right now. <laughs> It's the middle of June. What are you talking about? It's Michigan. Uh, of course it's <laughs> yeah, nice. Oh, yeah, that's right. It is. It's snowing outside now. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> that was at 9 a.m. It's 11 a.m. now, so now it's a storm or something. I yeah, know. yeah. So one thing I've noticed inside your comments, you don't just have, you know, you open up, you know, Amazing Cynical Man. It's not just Cynical Man. It's in, like, every page. It's another little comic strip. Yeah, like, there's a whole cast of characters. Yeah. yeah. Over here, Socrates Banquet. We can show a close-up of the book later. All the all the characters on the cover of the second paperback are characters from the comic strip. So I've um, really expanded my repertoire. Are these available online? They're, um, they're up on cynicalman.com. There's like one comic strip I change semi-regularly. And you can purchase the and book on it. There's also a big bunch on um, the Facebook Cynical Man page. Okay. He's got a thunderbird in here. How else can a bird pick up a human and fly with them? It must Ooh, be a thunderbird. It's a thunderbird. Yeah. And you can purchase the book on the website. You can purchase the book off the website, cynicalman.com. Very cool. Thank you for coming on. Of course, cynicalman.com is the website. Yes. Uh, we want to thank uh, DV Radio, which we are, which we air on DV Radio every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, that's a, a veteran-focused radio station, which we are in the chat room during that. And also check out all the other great shows on DVRadio.net. 
WDDR. Uh, so many great shows. And also our charity of choice right now is the DD Farm, which helps homeless veterans. They have it. Just look into it. It's really cool. It's a farmhouse. Um, they have some long term. Uh, they have the right now they're they have one residence that's been there for two years. Um, and they have all sorts of different therapies going on that work with horses and chickens, like farm. I don't know how you describe it, but you can check it out. Um, you know, it's a really cool charity. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you for coming on the show. Mark, where can people find you? Crazymark.com. You can find William at allaboutwilliam.com, which is probably off taking pictures right now. So I'm sure his photos of Down River Comic Con are probably up right now at allaboutwilliam.com. I'm Toden from Toden.com. And of course, you can find Media Letter Sandwich at medialittersandwich.com, dvradio.net, a ton of podcast apps, including iTunes and TuneIn and Stitcher and Podknife and Potable. And I could go on and on. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. We are open to sponsors, so thank you to our sponsor today uh, at RebornComics.com. I hope you enjoyed our discussion, and may the, the algorithms, algorithms be in your favor. favor.